Corn. Hi, my name is Mary Louise Greer. I'm a paediatric radiologist based at SickKids Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Hi, my name is Stuart Taylor. I'm a radiologist from London in the UK. We'd like to share with you today some highlights uh, relating to a review paper that's coming out shortly in the American Journal of Rontronology. The paper is entitled Perianal Imaging in Crohn's Disease, Current Status with a Focus on MRI. As you'll see in the highlights here, the topics that we'll be covering will be drawing attention to the role that pelvic MRI has in being first line for imaging perianal Crohn's disease in both adults and children, uh, given the complexity of fistulae that we often encounter in Crohn's disease. The next thing that we'll be looking at is the role of pelvic MRI and how it impacts upon guiding medical and surgical intervention and in assessing treatment response in patients with perianal fistulae. And finally, we'll be looking at how we can use uh, perianal imaging and in particular MRI uh, in inflammatory activity scores in adults and children and the role they have in quantifying activity and severity with responsiveness and prognostication under current investigation. In order to give you a little taste of what the paper entails, we're going to share with you a couple of examples of using uh, these indices and some of the newer ones that, that have been developed, in particular Magnify CD and PIMPAC, that have evolved from the initial scores at the Van Ash Index and the modified Van Ash Index. So with that in mind, I'd like to pass you over to Stuart, and he's going to be sharing with you figure seven. Great, thank you very much, Mary. So uh, as we've just uh, talked about, we're going to go through in the paper quite a few of the activity scores that have been devised for, for Crohn's disease, both the detail, how you, how you calculate the scores and the evidence base behind them. So if we just look at this figure, for example, um, we've applied the Magnify CD score to this. And uh, very briefly, what you do when you go through these scores is you look at the complexity of, of the fistula. This is an intersphincteric fistula, but there's an extension over to the right. So if you look at the definitions for Magnify CD, this becomes a complex fistula. And so it gets a score of two in that particular score. We then measured the length of the fistula. Uh, we haven't got the coronal imaging here, but this measured around two centimeters. And that's actually quite short. So we've got a score of, of naught. We then looked at the um, contrast enhanced signal. So it's the right panel. And we usually compare that to the adjacent vessel in this case, the enhancement is relatively subtle, very similar to the adjacent vessel, perhaps a little bit less, in fact. So this gave a score of, of mild enhancements, which is a score of, of zero. We also look at the pattern of, of enhancement. Uh, we don't see any low signal centre to this. There's no fluid in it. So we assume this fissure is a granulation tissue rather than an active pus. And finally, we look at the T2 signal of the fistula, again, compared to the um, adjacent vessels. And this is a little bit increased. So this got a score of two as well. So when you add up all these various factors, this patient had a magnified Crohn's disease score of eight. And in the paper, we'll go through uh, other scores as well, explaining how we, we calculate these and how we can use these. So I've talked a little bit about uh, an adult scoring uh, system here. So Mary, what about uh, in, in pediatrics? What do you use there? Thanks very much, Stuart. So up until recently, there have been no indices that have been specifically developed for children. There is work underway in actually looking at the Magnify CD and validating that in children, uh, but a newly published score is called PEMPAC, and this has been developed as part of the Image Kids Working Group, looking at uh, different aspects of perianal disease in children, taking into account in particular uh, the, the overall length of all of the fistulae um, and uh, uh, although we show some imaging here with, uh, with contrast, uh, we're able to actually calculate a score without the need for contrast in this instance. So I'd like to share with you an example, which is figure eight in the paper, which starts uh, at the age of four in this young boy, uh, and that fits into the category of very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. He had perianal disease, but no evidence of luminal disease at this point in time. And you can see in the top panel of images here that we have a, on the T2 added imaging a stir, we can see a, a long fistula here. This is actually an uh, intersyncteric and transyncteric and a short, uh, un, not shown uh, intersyncteric component. And the combined length of all the fistulae was 7.3 centimetres. Subsequent imaging uh, showed that that do, to be decreased in, in signal over time as he was older, and this is imaging from when he was 12. Uh, and as uh, you said in the previous example, that as you go from bright signal on T2 comparable to vessels and relatively dark signal here, this is in keeping with fibrosis. Uh, at the time of follow-up, um, there was a, uh, 
interval improvement and uh, that short fistula had resolved and the overall length was actually found to be uh, only 6.3 centimeters uh, and this has shown a good response uh, with decrease in signal on, on T2 and as well as you can see here, again, that, that low signal. And there's also decrease in enhancement. Uh, again, on the T1, you can see it's relatively low signal on the follow-up scan. That was some imaging down the track, but at the age of, of 12, it was a significant decrease activity compared to when he first presented at the age of four. So if we use the scoring system with PEMPAC to take into account these different elements of the length, the signal and the uh, complexity of the fistula and the extent, uh, at the age of four, he had a score that was 30 points and that equates to uh, cut off of severe disease. Uh, but by, by 12 years of age, that uh, score had dropped down to 13 in keeping with mild disease. So this is a very newly published score. And, and whilst there's been internal validation within the cohort from image kids, it certainly still needs to be looked at uh, in larger cohorts and an independent group. But it's very promising in dealing with uh, providing some index of activity and severity in children, which has a different pattern of perianal disease uh, and Crohn's disease can, compared to that in adults and often can be more severe. And with that, it uh, draws us to the next point of our paper, which is really how we can use imaging to give an indication of what's going to happen in the future. So I'll pass that back to you, Stuart, to comment on that. Thank you. Yeah, so we do end the paper with a, uh, a quite in-depth discussion of how the MR scores could perhaps uh, prognosticate for the future. So what the gastroenterologists and surgeons ideally would want to know is when they have a imaging uh, MRI scan of their patient and we document the disease, we could perhaps predict how that patient's going to respond to anti-inflammatory medication, biologic therapy, for example, so they can best judge the treatment plan. In the paper, we consider prognosis in two main areas. One is, as I say, the ability to predict ultimate outcome. But a second part of prognostication is if a patient's on treatment and you do a follow-up imaging MRI, can we then tell the surgeon or gastroenterologist how that patient's going to do longer term, looking at, the, at their response to their in, initial therapy? So if we just briefly consider those, um, those two aspects, there's actually not that much evidence at the moment that these MR activity scores can actually predict the long-term outcome. The most useful thing that we use in our day-to-day -day practice would be the complexity of the underlying fistula. So fistulae which are extensive, which have um, complications as abscesses, those involve the rectum, for example, they tend to have a worse uh, prognosis. And we know that MRI is very good at giving a detailed description of that. And that's very useful for the, for the clinicians. In terms of the factors that we can measure, such as T2 signal enhancement, fistula length, so far the only one that has perhaps a role is the actual length of the fistula. There's some data showing that uh, longer length fistulas tend to have a worse prognosis longer term. There's a lot of research going on of all the various activity scores, which uh, hopefully will address this. And just briefly, the final point which we cover in the paper is after a patient's been on treatment, you do a follow-up scan. Looking at that scan, can you predict their long-term outcome? Well, there's a bit more evidence suggesting that we can do that. We know that even though the fistula may be healed clinically to the examining physician, we can tell on MRI there's likely to be underlying activity still there. So over 50% of patients who clinically have had a good response when you do the MR scan, we find abnormal uh, changes on the MR, such as high T2 signal, for example. And those patients tend to do uh, worse. So what we're really looking for in our follow-up is the lack of, high, of T2 hyperintensity, the lack of gadolinium enhancement. And if your patient achieves those two things on their follow-up scan, they have a much better prognosis. Their long-term out uh, outlook is good because all the inflammatory activity is gone. So I hope we've given you a bit of a flavour of what we're going to cover in the, in the paper. Um, I hope you enjoy reading it and thank you for us both. Thanks for your time. Have a great day.